In 1996, Italian mineralogist Vincenzo Di Michele spotted an unusual yellow-green gem within one of Tutankhamun's necklaces. The jewel was tested and found to be made of a type of glass known as Libyan desert glass. The interesting thing regarding this, however, is its origins. To this day, no one seems to be able to explain how it formed. No trace of a crater has ever been discovered. An ancient meteorite, or indeed outer space object, scorching across the skies of Egypt is the basis for many religious teachings within this once amazing ancient civilization. They associated the objects and the flaming tails during such events with that of a phoenix, and the collected items, presumably nearly always meteorites, were then hammered down into wares. Nine small beads, stored at the University College London's Petrie Museum, dated to around 3200 BC, were found in necklaces along with exotic terrestrial minerals such as lapis lazuli, agate, and gold. They are some of the earliest iron artifacts ever found, and archaeologists have confirmed that they came from outer space. Meteoric iron is much harder and more brittle than copper. Quote, they were rolled and hammered into shape. This is a very different technology from the usual stone bead drilling, and shows quite an advanced understanding, showing the metalsmiths knew exactly how to work this rather difficult material," said Thilo Rarin, a University College London professor of archaeology. When American geophysicist John Wasson was consulted regarding King Tut's strange gem, he curiously linked the event with one within an extremely remote forest of Siberia, an event we have covered before. Quote, when the thought came to me that this required a hot sky, I thought immediately of the Tunguska event, he told Horizon. In 1908, a massive explosion flattened 80 million trees in Tunguska, Siberia. And whatever landed there over a century ago is still there, and it kills any living organism which settles above it. And what is most interesting surrounding all of this is the ancient Egyptian accounts of what they did with a rather peculiar, rather special type of object that was, at one point, retrieved from the glassy sands of Libya. A particularly different object, which they called a phoenix egg. That hieroglyph state was secreted away within a secret chamber deep within the Great Pyramid. We have covered before the hypothesis that these stories etched in hieroglyphics may be far older than the Egyptian culture which may have preceded it. Yet the question is clear. What could this phoenix egg be? Tutankhamun is not only the most famous of all the pharaohs, but he is unquestionably the character most wrapped in mystery. Although many are attracted to the legends of the unexplained curse or flock to the Cairo Museum to peer upon his wondrous relics, what many are unaware of is a rather incredible theory pertaining to an as yet undiscovered vault hidden in plain sight within his own purported ancient tomb. Known as the Second Chamber Theory, it was initially put forward by British Egyptologist Nicholas Reeves. He argued that it was the secret burial chamber of Nefertiti, who was originally the wife of Tutankhamun's father, Akhenaten. Legends say that she was one of the most beautiful women in history. Reeves argues that, due to King Tut dying suddenly, he was hastily buried in the outer chamber of Nefertiti's tomb, with the opening to her chamber then concealed somewhere within the tomb many millennia ago. Again, a tomb unlooted filled to the rafters with priceless golden relics. Reeves even claims that he himself detected a hidden passageway behind a funerary painting on one of the walls of the tomb. Thus, in 2016, an American survey team harnessing ground-penetrating radar peered into and beyond the walls within the tomb. However, they were unable to confirm nor reject the second chamber theory. Yet this did not dissuade anyone who had become convinced of the theory, coming to this conclusion via different avenues of study, continuing to be convinced of the theory's validity. So, after another unsuccessful attempt, a third was arranged by a new Minister of Antiquities set at a media conference, stating he would conduct a third GPR analysis to, quote, put an end to the debate. The third survey, led by Francesco Porcelli, 
of the Polytechnic University of Turin, subsequently came forward to publicly state, beyond doubt, that there was no hidden chambers within the tomb. However, this entire sequence of events can simply be perceived as a rather hazy attempt to put people off from covering this story, diverting attention away from its possible truth. Firstly, why three attempts to confirm that a chamber did not exist? For why would the first two attempts have openly admitted that they were not able to confirm such claims without doubt? How could a person from such an institution, if not funded to come to such a definitive conclusion, make such a post-statement? And why would so many from different academic backgrounds arrive at the same conclusion? Is there a secret chamber in King Tut's tomb? And if so, why is it being hidden? What could be inside it? We find the possibilities incredibly intriguing. Who built the Great Pyramids? How? Why? Questions many have attempted but seemingly failed to answer. Although claimed as tombs, with the different internal chambers within the largest, Khufu, named in representation of this purpose. Interestingly, Khufu, or Cheops, is the only one of the three pyramids with internal chambers. The other smaller two merely have tunnels beneath. An enigmatic box, whose lid has long been lost to history, lay within this enormous structure, long claimed to have been the sarcophagus of Khufu. However, although suspiciously small, no one seems to be able to explain how they got it into the chamber in the first place. It is as if the pyramid was built around, as it doesn't fit through any of the known entranceways. Since the 19th century, when these chambers were first rediscovered, a tremendous amount of research, though it must be noted, always supervised by official Egyptian antiquity academics, nonetheless, remarkable discoveries have at least been partially shared with the world. Most notably, Gantenbrink's door. Yet the tomb of Osiris, where this once inaccessible tunnel led, was, once the media was permitted back into the location, found empty, claimed by officials as being found conveniently vacant. A room only discovered thanks to 21st century technology, according to mainstream Egyptologists, was somehow looted. However, there still lay many mysteries within this most intriguing of structures, and we would expect at least one, or possibly many more, which no matter how long it takes us to rediscover them, will be too big to hide. For example, although we once thought the tomb Gantenbrink discovered was inaccessible, the chamber at the top of the structure, one of considerable size, estimated at 30 square meters, is so inaccessible. It was only found with technology used to register cosmic rays. a technology usually utilized in high-energy particle physics, capable of tracking particles called muons, produced when cosmic rays strike atoms in the upper atmosphere. These incredibly sensitive detectors were first developed for use in particle accelerators, but they have also been used to gaze into the inner bowels of many geological and ancient artificial features. In December 2015, Physicist Kunahiro Morishima of Nagoya University, Japan, placed detectors inside the Queen's chamber to detect muons passing through the pyramid. Thus, any large chamber still hidden within the pyramid would be detected due to a higher register of muons than expected from denser angles. The chamber's discovery was corroborated by two other teams of physicists. All three teams observed a large void in the same location above the Grand Gallery. It was a big surprise, says Tayubi. We're really excited, he continued. The researchers say it might even be made up of two or more smaller spaces. Tayubi suggests that it could be, quote, 
a second grand gallery. It is a discovery which we are... On the 25th of January, 2011, the streets of Cairo were being ravaged by a rioting population, demanding the end of President Hosni Mubarak's 30-year regime. While the world was distracted by the dramatic scenes of chaos upon the streets above, deep within the ancient dusty tunnels, a team of archaeologists led by Suzanne Bickel of the University of Basel in Switzerland was quietly making one of the most significant discoveries of the past century. They had initially found the top of a large round stone at the eastern end of the Valley of the Kings. The archaeologists suspected that it was just the top of an abandoned shaft, but before they could investigate, due to Egypt's political process regarding finds within the valley, they had to cover the stone rim with their own locked iron door, inform the Egyptian authorities, and apply for an official permit to excavate. A year later, after gaining approval to excavate, Bickel returned with a team of two dozen people, including field director Elena Paula Goth of the University of Basel, Egyptian inspector Ali Rita, and local workmen. Each took turns lying on the ground, head pressed against the shaft wall, one arm through a small hole next to the capstone, snapping photographs. They left little doubt that it was indeed an ancient tomb. On top of the debris rested a dusty black coffin, carved from sycamore wood and decorated with large yellow hieroglyphs on its sides and top. Bickel has stated that she has never seen an Egyptian coffin in such a good condition before. The dating of fragments of pottery made from Nile silt and pieces of plaster, commonly used to seal tomb entrances in ancient times, together with the age of the other nearby sites, have indicated that the tomb could be more than 3,000 years old. The hieroglyphs describe the tomb's occupant as being named Nahimi's Bastet. Egyptologists currently believe she was a lady of the upper class and of Amun. People have been claiming there was nothing new left to find in the Valley of the Kings for almost as long as they have been digging there. The Venetian antiquarian Giovanni Belzoni believed he had emptied the last of the valley's tombs during his 1817 expedition, while Theodore Davis, who excavated there a century later, came to a similar conclusion right before Tutankhamun's burial chamber was found. Fortunately, there is a growing number of people who are beginning to suspect that there is a wealth of discoveries still left to be made in the Valley of the Kings, the Nile Delta, and Egyptian as a whole. And thanks to discoveries such as these, interest in these existing mysteries grows by the day. It is interesting to see that in this period, even a wealthy girl was buried with quite simple things, Bickel says, comparing Nahim's Bastet's coffin and steel with the elaborate pottery, furniture, and food found in earlier tombs. Her wooden coffin was certainly quite expensive, she says, but nonetheless, it lacked the elaborate inner coffins found in similar burials. Is this the burial chamber of an extremely ancient queen? After reinforcing the coffin and securing the mummy, Bickel's team have transported across the Nile to Luxor, where a full investigation is currently being undertaken into the true identity of the mystery female. With substantial insight into the controversial finds within ancient Egypt, we personally suspect that often the tombs, which appear the most crudely designed, containing wooden sarcophagus, are generally found to be the most ancient. Furthermore, their hieroglyphic writings were often far more exquisite in nature. Could this be the discovery of an original burial, and the crude hieroglyphic claim of the occupant's identity a fake? Hiding the delta's true antiquity? A secret many fringe scientists have begun to believe is being protected by Egyptian antiquities. Many have come to suspect the Egyptians merely copied the original builders of the pyramids, after taking occupation of their structures many years later. Supportive evidence for these claims comes in many forms. Erosion upon the pyramids, and especially the Sphinx, including over 100 underground chambers we are currently researching discovered under Giza in 1995 by a team led by Kent Weeks, which also show strong evidence of several flash flooding events 
involving seawater throughout their long existence. The lack of any written detail pertaining to the construction of either monument in any hieroglyphs found in ancient Egypt, and so on. We find it incredibly intriguing that more was not made public regarding this amazing find, which leads us to suspect it may be a highly important, albeit highly controversial, discovery. We will continue to do research on Nahem's Bastet and will endeavor to keep you all informed regarding any notable findings. Discovered in 1860 within the astounding Valley of the Kings, the Atlantis Ring has since proven to have been a most incredible of finds. Not only for the secret, sacred geometry that was found to have been inscribed upon this seemingly insignificant clay ring, but also for the strange, seemingly reoccurring pattern of curses or good luck talismans wrapped around the entire magic of this once incredible yet now lost civilization. Once discovered, it was said to cast a protective spell upon those who wore it a supposed positive energy force that, although as strange as that of the curse of Tutankhamun, is one that is far less mentioned within the career and discoveries of Howard Carter himself. This, regardless of the fact that it has since gone on to be an incredibly popular mass-produced product, once kept secret for many years by Carter himself also now sold under the claim that it does indeed emit a powerful energy field around the wearer. The science behind these claims we cannot claim to understand. However, the ring's modern popularity, along with the lack of coverage regarding this possible legend within the discussion of Howard Carter's career, we have found peculiar. Featuring two triangles, six small and three larger rectangles with a semi-cylindrical form, it was originally found by Marquis de Grain. A blueprint of the ring was soon sent to Carter himself, who made and wore a secret replica which he kept himself until his death in 1939. In 1922, Carter would discover King Tut's tomb. Before opening the tomb, hieroglyphics above the tomb's unbroken seal were read. It said, The wings of death shall touch all who violates the Pharaoh's eternal rest. Unperturbed, they opened the tomb, discovering treasures beyond all of their wildest imaginations. Yet, as warned, all who were involved in this discovery eventually met curious fates. With just Carter himself left, the one person who was undeniably the most guilty party in the entire excavation. He would not die until 17 years later, at the reasonably young age of 66. During these 17 years, however, the flurry of media attention around the claimed curse persisted. Interestingly, whenever asked how he had seemingly escaped the curse for so long, he would always reply that he had a secret talisman, a good luck charm, that protected him from the curse. This initial cast of the ring Carter had made, it turns out, he seemingly knew of its incredibly important geometric significance. Yet it was not until 1940 while going through his documents that his studies and indeed rules of wearing the ring were revealed to the world. His talisman, a replica of the Atlantis ring, a relic many thousands of years old, originally made from Eswan and clay, like something out of a holy grail story. It seems the least valuable, seemingly most conspicuous of finds turned out to be one of the most, if not the most valuable to Howard himself. Out of all the golden wonders he had ever unearthed, this one, one which he didn't even discover himself, he kept closest to his heart. It is because of this that we find the Atlantis ring highly compelling. To truly understand the astonishingly true history of the unfinished obelisk, one must first wade through a quagmire of well-financed fallacy. Infested with many a false prophet, incomplete or simply illogical conjecture, all of which, defended by countless academic figures of institutions of influence and power, acquired via the funding in their defense of a form of mass worship of academics' perception, as if an all-knowing authority. So, with things like the obelisk, for example, one begins to wonder if this all be by design. Since academic records of this monument began, 
No one who has described it, predictably, has ever managed to wrap their head around how such a stone could have possibly ever been moved. Ergo, all well-funded explorers, reporters, and journalists alike, with the expectant pressure of their return with a deciphered mystery. It would appear this explanation never arose, yet was skillfully averted. Firstly, the rock had indeed been abandoned abruptly at some point in history, conveniently allowing academia to make nearly all those interested in the obelisk overlook this eventual intention by its original creators, a distraction made by a fault line. Chris Dunn, an independent investigator held in varied regard, found that details of decoration were already being added to the stone as it was being hewn running exactly through this so-called fault, disproving this so long-held academic fallacy. Yet, alas, although the unfinished obelisk lay still attached to the strata of Earth, like that of the larger of the two megaliths in Yangsham Quarry, the largest some 16,000 tons, academia is not required nor would even attempt to provide any logical explanation as to how these blocks would have been moved. Additionally, however, and perhaps most revealing, is the pregnant lady of Lebanon, a 1,000-plus ton megalith, so large that just like that of the unfinished obelisk, no attempt was ever made to explain the ancient civilization responsible could have moved such stones to their final placements. Yet, remarkably, the proverbial nail in the coffin and vindication of our claim was the excavations made around the pregnant woman, recently revealing that this stone was not abandoned on a slight incline, as claimed, but was placed atop another stone of even bigger proportions, suggesting it was part of a once enormous structure and exposing this reoccurring academic strategy when it comes to dismissing the controversial. It is a reality which we find incredibly annoying. The Pyramid of Menkura, the smallest, yet by no means least interesting of the Great Pyramids of Giza, claimed to have been built by the Egyptian pharaoh Menkura some 4,000 years ago. The pyramid's origins, however, like the many other giant and perfectly carved structures and statues found throughout the Giza Plateau, no one seems to be able to explain how or why such figures within known, well-studied history accomplished such feats. With the entrance to the Chapel of the Cult, exposing just how much of a challenge this construction would have been for our copper-welding ancestors some 4,000 years ago. Lined with megalithic sandstone blocks, with some well over 100 tons in weight, the remains of basalt casting stones strewn around their feet, either disturbed by invading parties or simply fallen from where they once stood, in front of the megalithic blocks, all now exposed to the elements, with additional styles from other, now lost civilizations littered all around the pyramid, indicative of its rediscovered importance by other now lost civilizations who we feel clearly came and went since the pyramid's original constructions. This extraordinary section of the ruins are predictably rarely discussed or studied. We believe this due to the inexplicable nature of the surrounding ruins, in addition to further supporting claims that the casting stones found upon the pyramids are not only covering megalithic blocks of an even larger scale, but were a later addition just like that of the unfinished polygonal masonry, making up additional casing stones around the entrance of the Menkura pyramid itself. Furthermore, Menkura also contains inner chambers, just like that of the world-famous Cheops. Yet rumors that only Cheops possess such tunnels persist to the modern day. And one wonders why. Why was Menkura clearly focused on by several different conservation efforts? Why is it the only pyramid with Peru-style polygonal casing stones? Who could have possibly built the entrance tunnel, or indeed, the pyramids themselves? And why is the pyramid largely, and it would seem purposefully, overlooked? We find the possible motivations highly compelling.
Many of you have seen the recent viral video of a paraglider flying dangerously close to the top of the Great Pyramid of Giza with his GoPro, with some astute people noting that this footage snapped hieroglyphics on the very top of the pyramid. Although many believe these sites be littered with hieroglyphs, the mainstream paradigm would have you believe that this is, in fact, a fallacy. There are no tombs, mummies, or indeed hieroglyphs to be found anywhere upon or inside the Great Pyramids. The question then is, what is this writing? Is it true hieroglyphs? And if so, what do they say? We do not condone the climbing or indeed vandalism or decisions to climb and possibly damage these astonishing and priceless relics. Yet the question remains, are these authentic? If so, why cover them up? Well, we may be able to explain why these hieroglyphs could indeed be covered up and, in addition, also back up the hypothesis that the Egyptians did not build the pyramids, but rather merely re-inhabited these astonishing ruins, adapting lost technologies discovered and unraveled within, subsequently using the pyramids to impress and intimidate their neighbors and convince the world they built them, not only then, but all the way into the modern era. Yet I digress. Along with this photograph of hieroglyphs corroborating the aforementioned hypothesis, we also have the array of photographs displaying casing stones, some detached, possibly due to past cataclysm, protecting stones often many hundreds of tons in weight that are clearly of a far greater age than that of what we feel are more modern yet still ancient conservation efforts we feel later undertaken on the pyramids themselves. Furthermore, in addition to the water controversy theory, which presents the evidence for Anubis Lake around what is now the Great Sphinx, the face of the Sphinx itself displays significant rain damage. Yet we feel the most compelling and supporting evidence for the pyramid's true age is the layers of salt sediment that were removed from lower chambers all over Giza during its re-excavation. This suggestive submersion would explain not only the extreme corrosion present on an older surface-level stonework, but the abrupt end of this very ancient civilization, who, we posit, were responsible for not only the Great Pyramids, but ruins all over the Earth. How could we have varying levels of casing stones, each of a different stone, and some even of a polygonal nature, yet the stone behind be far greater eroded? How could there be hieroglyphs beneath where there would have been a capstone if these relics were not in the condition we see them today when re-inhabited? We find such questions, and indeed the hieroglyphs themselves, highly compelling. To truly understand the astonishingly true history of the unfinished obelisk, one must first wade through a quagmire of well-financed fallacy infested with many a false prophet, incomplete or simply illogical conjecture, all of which defended by countless academic figures of institutions of influence and power, acquired via the funding in their defense of a form of mass worship of academics' perception, as if an all-knowing authority. So, with things like the obelisk, for example, one begins to wonder if this all be by design. Since academic records of this monument began, no one who has described it, predictably, has ever managed to wrap their head around how such a stone could have possibly ever been moved. Ergo, all well-funded explorers, reporters, and journalists alike, with the expectant pressure of their return with a deciphered mystery. It would appear this explanation never arose, yet was skillfully averted. Firstly, the rock had indeed been abandoned abruptly at some point in history, conveniently allowing academia to make nearly all those interested in the obelisk overlook this eventual intention by its original creators, a distraction made by a fault line. Chris Dunn, an independent investigator held in varied regard, found that details of decoration were already being added to the stone as it was being hewn running exactly through this so-called fault, disproving this so-long-held academic fallacy. Yet, alas, although the unfinished obelisk lay still attached to the strata of Earth, 
like that of the larger of the two megaliths in Yangshan Quarry, the largest some 16,000 tons, academia is not required nor would even attempt to provide any logical explanation as to how these blocks would have been moved. Additionally, however, and perhaps most revealing, is the pregnant lady of Lebanon, a 1,000-plus ton megalith, so large that just like that of the unfinished obelisk, no attempt was ever made to explain the ancient civilization responsible could have moved such stones to their final placements. Yet, remarkably, the proverbial nail in the coffin and vindication of our claim was the excavations made around the pregnant woman, recently revealing that this stone was not abandoned on a slight incline, as claimed, but was placed atop another stone of even bigger proportions, suggesting it was part of a once enormous structure and exposing this reoccurring academic strategy when it comes to dismissing the controversial. It is a reality which we find incredibly annoying. No other ruins anywhere on our planet is surrounded with more controversy than that of the Great Pyramids of Egypt, or indeed its accompanying plateau. There are many factors to consider when it comes to Egyptology. Within academic fields, there are many no-go areas of study. Although hard work and research within permitted areas has taught us a great deal about the previous 4,000 years of the site's inhabitants, Yet regardless of the most astute academic thesis, there remains three, proverbially, large elephants in the room. When it comes to a full or even a mere fraction of an explanation in regards to the origin of these seemingly impossibly huge pyramids remains patiently absent. No accounts, illustrations of any kind from the era exists. It is simply illogical especially when one considers the sheer feat these structures must have been. We have presented many previous features, polygonal masonry being present on the pyramids. Eroded, yet younger casing stones protecting inner megaliths, clearly of a tremendous age. Salt sediment found encrusting the lower chambers, and so on, suggesting not only that the pyramids are much older than currently claimed, but were pre-flood ruins. Thus, questions arise. Just how old are the Great Pyramids? In addition to our study of the pyramids, we have also, in the past, asserted that the Sphinx was originally a lion, which, interestingly, correlates to the following hypothesis with fascinating accuracy. The Orion Theory the coincidence with pyramids aligned with Orion's belt and other significant constellational positions. Bavel and Hancock support the theory, believing the Great Sphinx was begun in 10,500 BC, creating reference to the constellation of Leo and the orientation of the entire complex with the Nile River and even Milky Way, claimed by them as connected respectively. Zeptepi, using similar methodology, put the age at over 13,000 years. These are clearly astonishing proposals, but the current paradigm for their chronology, we feel, is far too short a time span, and due to our own research, which has uncovered evidence indicative of pre-flood origins, copper tools for such an accomplishment a mere insult to intelligence. Yet, thankfully, Due to these various takes on events, their age remains highly contested, and to us, a mystery which is incredibly compelling. How can one still claim the pyramids to have been tombs when they are aware of the astounding burial chambers found within the Valley of the Kings? With the tomb of the sons of Ramses II being not only the largest, but what many archaeologists believe, second to the pyramids and their accompanying sphinx, is the next greatest discovery ever made within ancient Egypt. A literal labyrinth of chambers, it was initially discovered in 1825, yet due to its gargantuan scale, it wasn't until 1995, and thanks to an Egyptologist known as Kent R. Weeks, that we have begun to re-establish its true possible size. 
The tomb was examined several times, even being investigated by Howard Carter himself. Yet due to the outer tombs having been looted in antiquity, he simply used them as a dumping ground for rubble. It was not until 1995, during the Theban mapping project, when Weeks decided to clear the outer tombs. Approximately 70 rooms, lined along long corridors, running far back into the hillside were found. The number of rooms were then said to correspond to the number of sons the pharaoh sired. However, further excavations have revealed that the tomb is even larger, the size of an underground town cut directly from a granite hillside, its true scale still unknown. As of 2006, at least 130 chambers have so far been discovered, yet work continues on clearing the rest of this underground maze. We feel that although a later civilization, one lacking the knowledge to build such monuments, came along and claimed these relics as their own, with the possible motivation of an illusion of power, like that of the many other sites we cover worldwide, predictably, now also conveniently tied to these groups in academia. Yet the true feat these chambers would have been, along with the riches these pharaohs often left behind, are not only proof that these creations and collections of wealth were not only far beyond the ability of copper-wielding academically claimed builders, but that the archaeological evidence does indeed support the theory that these kings either ruled during the creator's civilization or built these monuments themselves. Yet how remains an infuriating enigma. We also feel their age, and indeed original lineage, in the true history of the Giza Plateau is what ultimately becomes convoluted. Yet I digress. Who built KV-5? It is a place we find highly compelling. Egypt, undoubtedly one of the most controversial places for modern history to try to keep the control of in regards to its origin, its true age, or original builder. When one either visits the Giza Plateau and is lucky enough to gaze upon these three great pyramids, or merely able to peer upon them through their computer screens, the first thing that will usually cross one's mind is awe and amazement. Yet this is often instinctually followed by an air of wonder, a curiosity as to how these miraculous structures were built, who could have possibly built them, and most importantly of all, why. Yet these questions, and indeed the pursuit of their answers, has been a mission for many well-funded deceptive individuals, for many years, to work very hard to distract you from either asking or pursuing as personal line of inquiry. For example, the Golden Mask of King Tut, along with the many other undoubtedly spectacularly valuable artifacts encrusted with precious metals and jewels that can be seen littering Egypt in its many museums and in the mountains of literature, books, and touring exhibits, which are published, pushed, and permitted in regards to this spectacular area of human history. The arrival of the last of King Tut's chariots at the Gem, which stands for the Grand Egyptian Museum late last month, was an exciting event for archaeologists worldwide and a source of pride for Egyptians. We moved today the sixth and the last chariot of King Tutankhamun from the, from the military museum in the citadel, which was there since 1987, to the gem. So we were keen to show you the moving of this uh, very nice artifact and the packing and unpacking uh, method, uh, professional method you are using by my colleagues in the ministry. The Tutankhamun exhibit, comprising about 5,000 pieces, will display for the first time all of Tutankhamun's artifacts in one place. Experts from around the world have been consulted on how best to preserve and display the collection. When museum workers accidentally knocked off the beard of King Tut's burial mask in 2015 and hastily glued it back on, there were fears that modern chemicals would cause permanent damage to the artifact. But scholars around the world put their heads together to save the golden mask. The museum will also be a venue for international conferences on Egyptology. And there is something in you always. We found out today in my talk, the family of Tutankhamun through DNA. How Tutankhamun died. No one murdered him. My excavation in the Valley of the Monks that we are doing right now, 
important excavation looking for the tomb of Archis in Amun. Maybe soon a tomb will be revealed in the Valley of the Monks or the West Valley of the Kings. Most of the artifacts in the Tutankhamun exhibit have been relocated from the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. Their new home is only about two kilometers away from the place where the young pharaoh's tomb was discovered in 1922. Egyptian officials say the gem will be the world's largest archaeological museum when completed and will hold about 100,000 artifacts in total. We have now 3,000 employees and workmen working inside the project. We are respecting our schedule. We'll be ready from the engineering uh, part by December 2018 and we are deciding now the perfect time or the ideal timing for the partial opening. In addition to King Tut's exhibit, the museum will display objects related to some of the greatest historic Egyptian kings, such as Ramses II, Akhenaten, and Amenhotep III. The ancient Egyptians, although claimed as ingenious, were merely adaptive, just like the equally acclaimed Romans and Incas of Peru. These re-inhabitants merely rediscovered the creations of a far older, far more advanced predecessor, who I believe not only constructed these sanctuaries, which these well-studied ancient civilizations merely used to enable the flourishment of their own cultures, in turn leaving a smorgasbord of architectural artifacts for funded academics to excavate and subsequently parade around, usually bombarding many individuals with deep insights into their lifestyles, culture, and death practices, are yet, as I would have predicted, nearly always absent that which supports my posit. Any logical explanation or demonstration of how these people built these structures in which they once inhabited, like a void in their academic study, one which is not only consistently ignored and concealed by these same academics, but are unknown facts to all of modern humanity to this day. This mystery is a result of the incredible nature of these structures, the precision involved in their constructions, and the enormity of some of the stones used in the building of the structures. Many of you may have seen my recent videos or be a keen follower of my work and, as such, are aware of the fact that due to my in-depth study of the unknowns regarding these sites worldwide and the collection and collaboration of the similarities and differentiabilities I have personally collected and categorized regarding many of these ancient structures, I have personally been able to establish a very strong, evidence-based hypothesis regarding the identity of three separate lost civilizations, which I have established using signatures within their style of building, and by default differentiations in their styles of building, to unquestionably identify them as separate yet particular groups responsible for the different unexplainable structures spanning the entire globe. Yet although these groups have indeed crossed paths, such areas as Aswan Quarry and most significant to my own research in Italy, where the polygonal civilization built upon the Cyclopeans' work, allowing me to establish which preceded which, and although these groups have been established to have abandoned projects midway through, thus indicating that they came to a sudden and untimely demise due to cataclysm, the civilization responsible for the pyramids, and indeed the movement of the blocks at Baalbek in China, which all far exceed 1,000 tons, is yet another civilization which far predated all which I have already identified. These three civilizations are the Polygonal Civilization, the Cyclopean Civilization, and the Neolithic Civilization, each with their own unique building techniques and identifiable stone-cutting signatures in their technologies. The pyramid builders were unimaginably more capable than all three. And although the Neoliths, who indeed have created some astonishingly advanced ruins, could have quite possibly been a surviving remnant of this civilization, this digression is for another time. Though at sites such as Baalbek, the Trilithon, which contains stones over 1,000 tons, there are Cyclopean stones built atop the stones, and at other places in the world, polygonal masonry has been found, such as Axum in Ethiopia where the toppled obelisk is said by some to be in excess of 1,000 tons, I have never, and now strongly feel will never, 
find any indicative evidence of these civilizations building the footings under any of these gigantic megaliths, as they were not responsible for their creation or placement. Additionally, the civilization responsible for the pyramids, and these enormous megalithic blocks elsewhere, were also the civilization who created the false door. A mysterious rock-carved feature, also found littering the now-exposed mega-metropolis found beneath the Guatemalan rainforest by penetrative radar. Taikal, part of this metropolis, the place where the plaque illustrating a past global cataclysm was once found, also has pyramids built solely leading to these false doors, with one found in Peru, built into the only rock face containing a very peculiar crystal known for its resonance qualities in amplifying radio waves. I feel that much of the spectacles found in modern Egyptian museums are merely distractions from the really important truths which we should all be focusing on instead, such as the true age of the pyramids, structures which, in the past, I have also independently identified as still possessing three separate identifiable stages of attempted casing stones for conservation, each significantly older or younger than each other, with the true exoskeleton of the structures made of stones far in excess of 1,000 tons. Join us next time where I will expose the controlled opposition within the fringe fields of archaeology which have stemmed from a growing pursuit for the truth of these facts, with a focus upon the water erosion hypothesis of the Great Sphinx, why it is a misdirection, and the Sphinx's true, original, undeniable identity, facts and truths exposed, which are undoubtedly highly compelling.